is my you know anecdotal perception of what happened i mean is that is that accurate mike i mean it just seemed like we went to zero to 60 with turkeys for a little while there yeah for sure i mean what was happening is state agencies and you know in collaboration with with nwtf they you know agencies were trapping and transporting wild turkeys all over north america and agencies were putting birds into areas that there were already birds and they were putting birds into areas where no birds existed and those populations started exploding what is up everybody mark on the mic here spring is in the air i'm not gonna go and say it has officially sprung but we're getting close and spring to a lot of folks, including myself, means it's time to talk turkey. But today we're going to talk maybe less about turkey tactics and more uh, a state of the wild turkey union. And to help us do that, we've got Mr. Mr. Michael Chamberlain, Doc Chamberlain, the wild turkey doc. You go by a lot of different names, uh, Mike, but we've got uh, you here joining us virtually uh, to help us out here. So thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. Yeah, glad to be with you, Mark. We uh, we are doing a little precasting. You've got quite the uh, the backdrop behind you. Uh, uh, some incredible memories adorning your wall, uh, including one absolutely beautiful caribou bull where we ended up doing almost like a state of the uh, the caribou union podcast there <laughs> before we got started here. But might have to do that one down the road. Yeah, for sure. That was a that was an incredible hunt. It's been a long that was, like I told you that was a long time ago, but it was it was certainly memorable. I mean, it sounds sounds memorable. Things have changed over time, and and that, that that can definitely be the case. You know, I mean, in some ways, some parallels with what we're going to talk about today, as far as like you know, you hunted a herd that was you know up 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 up, and then you know saw a decline for for a variety of reasons, including predation, uh, and. Uh, you know, we're seeing some parallels, you know, with uh, with our wild turkeys these days. In the turkey uh, world, yeah. Yeah, for uh, sure. Before we get uh, too deep here, what um, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your, your personal background as it relates to turkeys and, and your professional background as it relates to turkeys, and then we can kind of dive into... Um, you know, um, all the things, uh, you know, that, uh, that are, uh, affecting, uh, turkeys these days. Yeah. So I was, you know, from a personal side, I was a suburban kid that, that grew up in, in Virginia. Um, my dad was a, was a diesel mechanic, had his own business and he, he worked really, really hard to generate what little income that, that we had. And, so I got to spend time with my dad on Saturdays. That's, uh, we could hunt or fish and on Saturday. And so that's, that's kind of what defined my youth is I was, you know, I worked during the week going to school and then on the weekends I was waiting on my dad to, to spend time outdoors. And, uh, so yeah, I, I went to, I went to college, knew I wanted to to go into wild, quote unquote wildlife biology I had no clue what that meant and as i got closer to graduating with my bs uh from virginia tech i started thinking I, I really need to go to graduate school and i need to uh get a better higher paying job in the field than i would have gotten otherwise now now mind you nobody gets into what i do to make money <laughs> I'll just tell the listeners that no nobody goes into quote unquote wildlife science or wildlife biology to make money. That's just the, re just the reality of it. Um, so I went to graduate school, was fortunate enough to get into graduate school. And when I was accepted, the the professor that agreed to mentor me had three different research studies that he had available. And one of them was a wild turkey study. And so he said, you're the top candidate that I have. You pick which project you want. And I picked the, the turkey study. And that was it. That that launched where I'm at now. I, I was a turkey hunter then, but I knew nothing about turkeys other than how to kill them. Um, and when I started 
trapping them and radio tracking them, I just became infatuated with the bird. They're just from a, an ecological behavioral standpoint, they're just fascinating animals. And I got through graduate school, went, did a, a PhD, same topic and have been fortunate enough to be supported by state agencies that were interested in turkey research and trusted me to do it ever since. So uh, it's been 30 years since I caught that, actually been 31 years since I caught that first wild turkey, and I'm still plugging at it. Absolutely incredible. What, uh, what made you pick uh, the wild turkey study versus the other ones that were on the table? Was it just like your kind of your personal interest in, in hunting the wild turkey? Like, I mean, it yeah. certainly set you on a, a very, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say a, a trajectory in your life that, you know, you're still working on today. Yeah, that was pretty much it. It's, I mean, I was, I wasn't a passionate fanatical turkey hunter at the time. You know, I was, a, I was a young adult, but I had turkey hunted since I was young and, and we actually turkey hunted at that time a lot in the fall. And, and yeah, I just looked at the different projects and I thought, man, a turkey, you know, getting to study turkeys would be really cool. And I had no clue what that, you know, what that involved, but yeah, that, that set me on this trajectory that, you know, ended, ended up with me doing what I do today. Um, do you remember, uh, do you remember what the other studies were that you could have picked from? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? One of them was a study, um, looking on at Fox squirrels Okay. of all things, you know, not very sexy. <laughs> and the other was a project on wood ducks. And okay. Yeah. And interestingly, the, the student that did that project ended up, he's been very successful in his career as well. Um, he actually is, is now very high up in ducks unlimited and, and, you know, it's interesting. I look back at our time in graduate school together and, you know, who would have thought that, you know, a guy that's doing a project on wood duck boxes would have ended up being as successful as he's been as well. So, but yeah, it was either wood ducks, fox squirrels, or turkeys. So I think I went with the, at least to me, the, the sexier pick. I think, uh, yeah, probably been a little, I, I would have picked the turkey too, though. Given, given, given that selection, I would have gone with the turkey too. I, uh, my home state is Washington state and my brother went to the uni university of Washington uh, so he is a Husky. I went to Washington State University, so I'm a Coug. My brother, he got a minor in, in fisheries, you know, and I mm -hmm. grew up hunting and fishing and, you know, like always an interest in, you know, just the outdoors and the animals and, and uh, you know, uh, fish that inhabit it. Uh, and so when I went to WSU, I was like, well, I'll major in fisheries, you know, and I'm not a, I'm not a big planner. And so I got there. And I was astounded to find out that they did not have a fisheries program, Mike. So I had to, mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to change gears. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. I might be in the fisheries world. Who knows? But uh, at least at the time, they didn't they didn't have a program. Which you know, I mean, that does make sense because not not a ton of water to do you know research projects. There's definitely some in the area. But um, when I think back to my time in Washington, though, Mike, like I can remember. For the bulk of my, you know, youth there, turkeys weren't really a thing. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I remember, you know, finding out about turkey hunting. It was like this kind of mysterious thing. If you knew somebody that had gotten a turkey and knew where tur they could find turkeys, uh, that was a big deal. You know, they were basically a turkey whisperer. You had to go talk to that guy and, and try and get the scoop. Because it just was it wasn't a thing growing up. Then all of a sudden, it was a big thing. And I, I feel mm -hmm. like that was kind of the case in a lot of states where we had uh, this uh, incredible uh, recovery of, of turkeys in, in native ranges, um, possibly in ranges they hadn't previously inhabited. I'd love for you to touch on that. But, um, I mean, am I, is my, you know, anecdotal perception of what happened, I mean, is that, is that accurate, Mike? I mean, it just seemed like we went to zero to 60 with turkeys for a little while there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what was happening is state agencies and, you know, in collaboration with, with NWTF, they, you know, 
agencies were trapping and transporting wild turkeys all over North America. And agencies were putting birds into areas that there were already birds and they were putting birds into areas where no birds existed. And those populations started exploding. And what you, to your point, what you actually saw was, was this bird being re not reintroduced, but actually introduced into areas that they had not natively occurred. Gotcha. And so out in your area, you know, you had, for instance, Eastern, the Eastern subspecies being relocated to, to Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, you saw different subspecies being moved to different parts of North America and, and populations were, were, were really doing well. And that's kind of what you, that was your point of reference there is that it, we didn't have turkeys, it seemed. And then suddenly a decade later, there's, you know, agencies are saying we have turkeys now. Let's, let's start a spring season. Let's do that. You know, let's liberalize, you know, opportunity and let's get out there and, and pursue this bird. And that was really, you know, there were, there were diehard turkey hunters that existed well before restoration occurred. And, and many of those men and women ended up being the true warriors of the restoration effort. They, they were the ones that, that went and, and helped train people to trap birds and move them. And, and then you see this boom in populations and then the popularity of turkey hunting explodes as populations are exploding. And then you kind of fast forward to where we are now and, as I, I think we're about to talk about, you know, now we're, we've seen things kind of come full circle in many ways and, and populations are not, are not doing as well as they were several decades ago. Some of that we predicted and some of that we have not. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I remember time, like I said, I remember time where there weren't turkeys and then a time like almost like it appeared like, nationwide it's like oh my gosh we did it everybody you know uh there's turkeys everywhere you know I, when i was in nebraska it seemed you couldn't find a tree row well sometimes you just can't find a tree row in nebraska but that's uh, true <laughs> but if there was a tree there's high likelihood there'd be a turkey in it you know and it's just like mm -hmm. oh my gosh just this just absolutely astounding incredible uh you know recovery and and just an amazing success story uh, and I guess why I'm kind of like not harping on that, but um, we're kind of seeing the back end of that a little bit now, it seems, in, in, in some regions. So, yeah, I mean, what you mentioned that some things you expect you may have expected or anticipated. So, like, are we perhaps, and I don't know if this is what you're alluding to, like on part of what is maybe like a, a normal or natural bell curve, you know, or um, so what are the things that you did expect it? And what are some things that maybe we didn't expect? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think most people that, that have a, some type of ecological background, you know, we know that when you restore animals to vacant habitats, they're going to go through this predictable increase and they're going to overshoot their carrying capacity. Okay. And then they're going to decline to an asymptote and, 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 and we hope the population stabilizes at that level. And then you'll see these very predictable year to year, very, you know, up this year, down for a few years, up for a few years, that, that type of thing. That's what we suspected would happen. And that is what has happened. The, the problem is that the decline that occurred after restoration has been much more steep than we want in many parts of the species range. So in other words, where we're, where we stabilized isn't where we want to be. Okay. Gotcha. And, and part of that is, you know, as restoration was occurring, if you, if you go back and look at, if, if you're my age, I'm 52, and I, I can distinctly remember what the 80s and 90s look like. I can remember the early 2000s, 
just go back and look at how much our world has changed in the last 20 years. I mean, it, it seems like, you know, 9-11 was, dec- it was yesterday in many ways. Yeah, it's 20 plus years event. Look at what's changed just if you drive around the landscape or, or get up in a plane and fly for a, you know, a commuter flight across the United States and look out the window and see what's changed, how much more fragmentation there is, how many roads are out there, how much larger cities are. And so, uh, so much has changed since we started putting these birds out. And, and I think what happened in many ways is that these populations were stabilizing, but suddenly were being impacted by all of these changes to our world. And the predictable result was they started declining at a greater rate than we wanted. And now what we're looking at is, you know, to to where we started with the quote unquote, the state of the union. Well, the state of the union is in a lot of areas, we don't have the density of birds that we want. And the question becomes, how do we, you know, how do we resolve that? How do we write that ship? Yeah. What, what regions are being most affected by now or uh, not by now, but um, what regions are being most affected now uh, and what are is the predominant reason just that that changing landscape or are there you know what what factors are at play i'm sure there's many many that you know collectively are um you know causing these declines and 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 having these populations not be exactly where we want them um what's going on there yeah so for the first the first question the declines have been most precipitous and most obvious in the southeastern United States and the Midwest. So if you look, you know, across the Southeast, populations have declined, productivity's declined. Uh, agencies have made, many agencies have made a number of changes to spring regulations trying to curtail harvest because harvest has declined as well. Some of those same trends have popped up you know, within the past five years in states like Oklahoma, Nebraska, and Kansas, who have also made a number of changes, states like Ohio. I mean, so these 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 declines are are widespread. And yet in some areas, say parts of the Northeast, it appears turkeys are doing quite well. So I don't want to paint the picture that you know, it's uniform doom and gloom everywhere, but, but there are places that populations are not doing as well. And it, and it seems to be that the Southeast and kind of the Midwest are the, are the, are the two that are carrying that unfortunate banner right now. And and to some degree, at least to the Southeast, you know, the Southeast is where restoration really that, that, it was completed sooner in the Southeast than anywhere else in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because a lot of the remnant populations that were used for restoration were in the Southeastern United States. So, so in, in some ways it's kind of predictable that the Southeast would be the first to see these, these declines after restoration occurred because of what we just talked about, this kind of natural decline that you would see, you know, after you restore animals to a to the landscape the reasons are are multi multi multi-focused for sure without a i don't think you you would get any any reasonable person that does what i do to say that anything other than habitat would be number one on your item list of this is one of the primary drivers of these declines. I don't think anyone would argue that. And and there's a lot to unpackage there because it's not just we're losing habitat, which we are. We're we're losing habitat. If you get on Google Earth and just scroll back to 1990 and start moving around places like, you know, I live in central Georgia. If you move around the Atlanta metro area, go to Charlotte, go, 
go to some of these cities and see how the footprint has expanded across the landscape in 30 years. Um, so it's, it's, it's loss, but it's also fragmentation. We've, we've taken our environment and we've split it up into tinier and tinier pieces, whether it's for suburban development, whether it's for changes in land ownership, uh, family patriarch dies, property sold to 10. Now there's 10 owners for this 2000 acres instead of one, uh, nine of those owners are absentee and they don't manage the property at all. And, and so you, you kind of have these scenarios where the management of the landscape that we have left has changed and, and we've kind of fragmented things in a way that benefits predators more than it benefits turkeys. And what I mean by that is when you take large intact pieces of habitat and you split that up into smaller chunks you put roads through it you put rights of way through it what you've done is make a predator's job easier so a, a predator like a raccoon that hunts primarily with its nose or a coyote that hunts primarily with its nose and then uses its vision to chase and capture prey um, species like a, say a bobcat that would sit and hunt along, hunt along an edge and then sit and wait on prey to come by it. When you create all of this, these fragments, you benefit those types of animals versus an animal like a turkey. So that's kind of that the habitat side of it. And, and that kind of feeds directly into the predation issue, you know, turkeys, Turkeys are killed by predators, and they always have been. And that's one of the primary reasons they're so incredibly wary is because everything wants to eat them. But when you stack the deck in favor of the predator in many ways from a kind of a, a habitat perspective, then you make it more difficult to be a turkey. And that's what I see when I move about much of the United States, I see habitat that's more difficult to see through. I see habitat that's taller, it's denser, it's brushier. Um, I see lots and lots of fragments and edges and things that would put a turkey walking along a dangerous route, like a roadside or a power line. And the predictable result is the bird loses. And, and so we see incredibly high rates of nest loss, about 80% in many of our populations, nest loss. We see very low brood survival, about 30%. Um, so, and what that means is, you know, 80% of your nests fail and, you know, two thirds of your broods don't make it a month. And so they're not, we're not producing as many turkeys as we want in, in many populations. In some populations we are, but in many we aren't. And then you tack on the fact that while this has been occurring, we, we hunt this bird primarily during its breeding season. So you have these things we've talked about. Populations were exploding. Uh, hunting was becoming more popular. Look at how turkey hunting has changed over the past few decades. It's wildly popular. Uh, all these tools and techniques and all these things that we have that improve our efficiency as hunters. Meanwhile, populations have been declining under our noses. And we we harvest this bird while they're breeding, while they're they're trying to generate young. And so you you kind of put all that together, and and that's that's what we think. That that's my take on, you know, the primary factors influencing these declines. And then then there are other things that may pop up in your area that don't in mind, like disease issues one year that that may cause population declines, um, you know, isolated events that are not, you know, this is, you're going to sound crazy, but hurricanes along the Gulf coast. Sure. 
I mean, we've seen through our research that, you know, five to 10% of birds may be killed during a hurricane event. Um, so you, you knock out 10% of your population along a coastal area during one storm and you get three storms in a, in a really severe summer. Well, there you go. Um, so all these other factors are at play, but, but the habitat predation kind of harvest theme is, is pretty much uniform across the species range. I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad you touched on one thing there because it wasn't intuitive to me when you talked about, oh, the southeast and the Midwest seem to be, you know, maybe struggling the most or we're seeing the, the you know, more drastic declines there. Because I was like, to me, you know, these are the traditional wild turkey strongholds. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, this is where where a lot of our, you know, turkey roots come from. And it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, and then and I guess it's a also a good wake up call. And somebody's like, wow, if it can happen there, you know, what about number one, we got to work on fixing that, but also let's keep our eyes open, uh, you know, in all, in all the other areas that we, uh, that we have wild turkeys and, you know, want to see them prosper and, and do well. What, um, I, I want to make a comment to that because what you just said is extremely important. And a friend of mine, who's a, who's a state agency biologist has said this in many meetings. If you don't think you have a problem right now, just wait. <laughs> and, and this person works in a state in the Southeast whose populations have declined dramatically over the past 20 years. And he'll tell you, if you don't see a problem now, just wait. It's coming to your your door just like it did to our door. It may not be as pronounced, but if your populations are doing quite well, and they seem to be exploding and expanding, there's going to be a natural pullback at some point. Um, so to, and, and that's why I think these conversations like what we're having are invaluable because if you are in an area where turkeys are doing quite well, don't take it for granted. Try to identify, you know, what the future may look like so that we can work collectively to ensure that where populations are doing well, they continue to do well. And then that, you know, and then we put some effort into trying to reverse these declines in in other areas that that's, that's one of the true values to having these conversations, I think is for people to realize that it, it may look really rosy in your area, but in many areas it does not. And the reasons that, that could impact populations in your area down the road are the same reasons that have already impacted populations in other areas where these declines are are obvious. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I know like even uh, not that many years ago, probably golly, you know, 15, 20 years ago, like I would have been under the mindset of, like I said, like we did it, everybody. Great job. Like we've restored the wild Turkey, you know, what, what's next on the docket to do? Not that that was, that was the mindset because I mean, for, I just, I, we laughed about it, although the laugh was kind of half hearted, but if you, if you go back and look the national wild Turkey Federation, who I've done, I've worked with for decades now, they had a, their, their, they had a slogan target 2000 and that the target 2000 was to restore wild turkeys to all of their range, all of the, their native range and beyond by the year 2000. And they beat that target. The, the, the agencies were ahead of that target. And so in many ways, when we got, we, and I'm not, I'm not pointing out NWTF, I'm saying we as a Turkey community, when we got to target 2000, we thought we hadn't, we had done it just to your point. We did it. Let's move on to something else. And right then you saw widespread declines in Turkey research. You saw widespread declines in restoration efforts because we kind of, everybody took their thumb off, their foot off the gas. And we thought, let's move on to other things. Let's put our priorities elsewhere and and I've said this on other podcasts from about 2003 to about 2009 
there was very, very little turkey research going on. And myself and one other colleague were doing a lot of it. And it was because what we just talked about, agencies said we did it. We need, we have other priorities, which is understood. We're going to put resources and man and woman power to those priorities. The turkeys are good. And meanwhile, these declines that we have talked about were already ongoing before restoration ever ended. It's just that we didn't, we didn't see it. We, when you look at data from one year to the next, there wasn't a problem. It took us looking at data across 20 years to go, whoops. Yeah, we got, we got something going on here. So it sounds like, you know, habitat, you know, fragmentation of that habitat is a big, you know, is a big issue. What are things, um, you know, I mean, some of it is, you know, you know, probably unfortunately and in- inevitable, right? You know, like even the house that I live in is in a subdivision, like at one time, that was either, you know, wild land or egg land that, you know, in some way could have benefited the wild turkey. Now I live there, right? And and that 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 expansion, I think, is, is probably a reality. Um, what are things that uh, landowners can do that, whether they own a big chunk of land or, or, uh, or a small chunk of land, to have that land... Um, and the habitat on it, you know, be optimal for, for wild turkeys and, and production of wild turkeys and recruitment and, uh, and, uh, their general well-being. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough, that's a long, that's a tough question. It really depends on two things. One kind of where you are on the planet. Yeah. And two, what, I, I kind of use this analogy. What are your strengths, if you will? So if you have a, a large property, you, and when I say large, understand that a turkey's home range across a year is thousands of acres. Okay. So let's just say, you know, two to 5,000 acres. Let's say you own a chunk of land that big. Well, you have a lot of strengths. In other words, you have, you very likely can impact multiple parts of a turkey's year with that size of a property um versus say you know someone like me that could never afford to own that kind of property maybe i have 10 acres or or 50 acres or something well then my strengths if you will are going to be much less pronounced so if i'm the the 50 acre you know landowner i'm trying to figure out in the broader context of all of the lands around me what are the strengths that i have maybe i have 50 acres of of hardwoods that are providing you know really good winter habitat the birds aren't staying on my 50 acres but they're using my 50 acres and that's a positive for the flocks in that area okay well then i'm going to conserve those hardwoods not saying I'm not going to do any timber harvest or anything, but I'm going to to wisely manage the hardwoods on that property rather than, say, convert them to pine plantations. Or let's say I own 100 acres and I see turkeys every summer from about June until mid-July and routinely see hens with poults. Well, just understand that you are sitting there on valuable brooding habitat. Figure out where you're seeing those birds. Try to think through why. And then conserve that so that there's consistency because wild turkeys are very interesting. They go back to the same places every single year to breed. So another scenario I don't see any turkeys on my land and then all the entire fall and winter, I don't see any turkeys. And suddenly March the 15th, I start seeing turkeys. Well, understand that you're sitting on breeding habitat and they're going to come back to your property every single year at that time. 
So try to identify why is that, you know, right outside my window here, it would be open habitats adjacent to hardwoods. In other words, they're transitioning out of their winter home ranges. They're leaving these hardwood dominated kind of, you know, where they've e been eating acorns for months and they're moving nearby to areas where they can strut and drum and display and be seen by hens. And they've been doing that for, for years and years and years and years. So that's, I know that may not answer your question, but it, it kind of depends on where you are. And it, to me, I always try to identify what is my strength. And if you, if you can identify that, if you own very small properties, this may not matter, but if you own larger properties, you can also try to identify your weaknesses. You know, what, what do, what am I lacking here that could benefit turkeys? In other words, hey, to the previous scenario, I didn't see any birds until March. Well, why are they, do you not have any winter habitat on your property? And if so, where's the nearest wintering habitat? Maybe it's two miles down the road. Um, and in some cases, this bird just uses too much space. You, you couldn't, unless you own very large properties, you're not going to hold your turkeys. If you will, you're going to be sharing turkeys with, with a lot of your neighbors. Yeah. 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 You know, after I asked that question and, uh, you did make me think it's like, well, yeah, that does depend. Right. You know, where, where I grew up hunting turkeys is dramatically different than a lot of the turkey habitat that I hunt now. I grew up hunting in the, you know, southeast Washington. We were in elk country, mule deer country. We'd see whitetails, you know, black bears. Uh, it was pine forest, predominantly public land, where, like, I'm not a landowner. I guess in some ways I'm mm -hmm. a landowner, but I don't have the ability to manage that land myself. You know, those turkeys mm -hmm. just found that habitat suitable and, and were making a living there. So, yeah, I mean, it really does you know, depend. You got, I mean, and, and really even within that state, you know, you've got Rios and the uh, you know, a region of the state, you've got Merriam's in a region of the state, you've got Eastern's in a region of the state, all occupying differing habitats for different reasons that I would assume suit those birds now, birds best um, with, you know, I'm sure there's some overlap in areas too. You'd probably know a little bit more about that than I do. But um, yeah, when I initially asked that, I was thinking it in the context that I hunt birds a lot right now where there is a lot of private land ownership and things mm -hmm. like that. What, um, is there anything yeah, for sure is there anything happening on you know larger tracts of public lands that's benefiting or not benefiting birds in in certain regions I mean certainly there's there there are activities that do benefit turkeys on public lands I mean you have agencies that are that are conducting you know timber management programs that that are thinning the forest and you know turkeys they use their vision to survive that's their primary means of survival so so turkeys have to be able to see for the habitat to be high quality so activities that open up our environment that create early successional vegetation on the ground that turkeys can see over and through like prescribed fire tenor, timber thinning those things that agencies use obviously benefit turkeys one on the flip side one thing that i see a lot in my part of the world that i know you see in your part of the world as well is a lack of timber harvest mm -hmm. um and, and you you have situations like you know here where the, the u.s forest service announces a, a timber cut and they have lawsuits filed against them left and right because someone doesn't want to see a clear cut doesn't want to see you know timber work on the side of a mountain in the appalachians and and so you see broad expanses of of our world now that don't they're not they're not disturbed they're and much of north america is supposed to be disturbed naturally whether it be fire or, or, or periodic events that cause changes to force structure and, and reduce succession to where, you know, it's early successional versus these closed canopy forests that many of us see now. 
and that's so yes there's 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 two sides of that that coin there's a lot of things that we know benefit turkeys and there's a lot of things that that agencies are trying to do to benefit turkeys but they're hamstrung just from societal pressures and political pressures to that prevent them from being able to do all of the things that they that they seek to do yeah that's uh you know you see that or i've heard like um which i know like agriculture in a lot of ways you know benefits wild turkeys and wildlife you know provides a, a food source at times a uh, cover but you hear the the term like uh, monoculture you know mm-hmm. come up and things like that and and when we aren't doing timber harvest or if, if there aren't you know natural fires or prescribed fires opening up that landscape um, is that what you're saying you kind of end up with that that monoculture that's a little bit potentially less suitable to the birds yeah and you end up with with vegetation that's that isn't ideal for turkeys it's it's too dense you know, a lack of disturbance particularly in areas that are very productive like the southeast mm-hmm. you have really productive soils if you don't do something to the vegetation it succeeds very rapidly it grows very very rapidly and within a few years it's no longer turkey habitat and that's what I see when I travel a lot. You know, this it's much less pronounced when you get out in areas like, say, uh, say Nebraska, for instance, or South Dakota or, or Kansas. When you get out in those areas, completely different scenario. You, you may have uh, a tremendous amount of disturbance, but it's disturbance driven around mechanized agriculture and and much larger field sizes and a reduction in early successional vegetation along, you know, field borders. And, and so a totally different scenario than you see, say in a forested landscape, but the end result is the same. It, it's a reduction and loss of those high quality, early successional vegetation communities that turkeys, you know, they get seeds from, they get insects from, they nest in those areas, they take broods to those areas. So you see a corresponding loss just, you know, just like you see here in the Southeast in areas of the Midwest where it's agriculture that, that is linked to the changes in, in vegetation. Interesting. Interesting. Switching gears a little bit to the predation side of things. You've done some pretty interesting studies there. Would you mind touching on some of the studies that you've done throughout your career and, and, and what you discovered, you know, through them? Yeah. Yeah. So I've done a lot of work with predators actually that my, I'd say the first 10 or 12 years of my academic career, I did as much or more predator research as I did Turkey research. I, I did a lot of, of work on bobcats and coyotes and foxes and raccoons and wolves and black bears and, um, and some of the more interesting stuff that we found, I, I'd say w- was targeted at, at coyotes and, and raccoons. The raccoon work, I think is really interesting in many ways, because one thing we found was when you use prescribed fire, raccoons avoid those areas. Hmm. They, they are not foraging in areas that are that are managed with prescribed fire so the first year or two after a prescribed fire particularly the year of the fire raccoons avoid those those stands and i think it's just because you're you're changing their prey availability you know that you're you're removing soft mass like blackberries and dewberries and you're you're changing the environment in a way that they need to go elsewhere within their range. That was one. The other thing with raccoons that we found, we we set up an experiment where we fed raccoons. And what we were trying to do, we we put feeding areas within their their ranges and we tracked them intensively with telemetry. And what we were trying to figure out is what does it look like when a raccoon starts to basically imagine walking around in the environment and suddenly encountering a a lot of prey, a lot of food. How do you behave? 
uh, how long do you stay at that spot and 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 how do you start moving once you encounter prey we, what we wanted to try to figure out is what does it look like when a raccoon cues in on a prey source and then suddenly starts searching intensively for it and what we were trying to get at is this notion that are raccoons going to areas where turkeys are nesting and and foraging in those areas intensively and if so could that be contributing to this incredibly high nest loss we see because raccoons do eat turkey eggs and what we found was that they do not do that um their their behavior once they encounter prey is very predictable they go they they start bouncing around in a circle if you will and, and they'll intensively use a spot and then they'll move a short distance and and and, and w- what they were doing is going from bait to bait in our experiment and as soon as they had it kind of exploited what was there they left hmm. and just and moved on and we did this over and over and over and over and over and then we took all of the telemetry we were doing on raccoons naturally in in the environment because we were simultaneously tracking raccoons and turkeys at the same time and when we looked at how raccoons behave naturally they don't exhibit that foraging behavior in areas that turkeys nest and our conclusion from that was that nest loss from raccoons is more of just an opportunistic thing they just stumble into these they smell and you know they smell the hen or they smell the eggs or whatever they go over and they eat the eggs versus they climb out of the tree at night and they go search in areas where turkeys are nesting and and target nest they're not doing that um so then the question becomes well what does that mean well what it what it means to me is that predation of nest is is kind of almost random and we've done a lot of work since then and all of our conclusions are the same they parallel that first study it seems like predation is kind of a random event if if you happen to nest close to an area that raccoons or coyotes or whatever are using chances are you're going to lose that nest but if you happen to put a nest in an area where there's not a lot of predator activity, you got you have a pretty good shot. Um, that's kind of was the was the take home of that. The the coyote work we did was really it was more. I, I think what was more interesting about the coyote work was the fact that many of the coyotes you see are nomads. They weren't there yesterday. And they're not going to be there tomorrow. We've found, and and other studies have found this, that at least a third of all coyotes that are out there are transients. They're just moving. They may literally be 10 miles away tomorrow. Really? Yeah. And some of these coyotes use enormous areas. Think portions of a state. Uh, We had some of these transients that moved 250 miles. Uh, and what they're doing is they're just nomads. They're just moving around from one. They're 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 hoping a home range opens up, and until then they just bounce around trying to survive. And what that means to a private landowner, particularly one that's interested in doing predator management, is at least a third of the coyotes that you would put a trap on weren't there. So there's this surplus of coyotes on the landscape, if you will, that are not the the resident coyotes that are killing a lot of the game species on your property. These transients are responsible for some of that. So when you go in and you remove a certain number of coyotes from a property, just understand that at least a third of them are not coyotes that were living on that area to begin with. They just happened to pass through over a course of a couple of days and got caught. And we, we see this every, every coyote population has shown this, that there, there are quite a few that if you catch them today, 
put a, a GPS collar on them two weeks from now, they're 50 miles down the road. I guess so. I mean, could it stand a reason? I was like, well, I might not have helped the turkeys on, on my place, but I might have helped them on somebody else's place. Well, yeah, what you're actually doing is with those transients, you're just taking out individuals that really are, aren't that relevant from a predation standpoint anyway, because what they're doing, they're just moving constantly. So they're not, they're not, they're not, let's, we'll we'll shift gears to like deer, for instance, you know, fawn predation is a, is a hot topic relative to coyotes because deer is, is, is at least in the Southeast deer are the primary prey of coyotes. So what we've seen is that transients aren't eating a lot of fawns either. Oh, really? It's the resident coyotes that are that are killing the fawns, and it's because those residents those residents are pairs. It's a it's a breeding pair with their offspring. They're using a defined home range, and they're hunting it repeatedly. They're very familiar with it. They know where to go to be successful. Versus this younger coyote that is traveling from two counties away, comes through there, spends a day or two really doesn't know what he or she is doing takes whatever opportunity they can get if they stumble upon a fawn would they eat it well of course they would but not to the same degree that a mated pair that's hunting cooperatively in areas where fawns would be dropped they're going to have a disproportionate impact on fawns versus that transient and that's what we've seen when we looked at their diets there there are some breeding pairs that eat a lot of deer gotcha. and there's and there are some that don't and so that uh we got off on a little bit of a side rail there with the coyotes but between those two groups of studies from a predation standpoint it really just speaks to me about how complex predation is it's not just this this very matter of fact vanilla process it's much more complex because these species are more complex than than we think in many ways like you know we were talking about with this coyote behavior um does does that coyote deer behavior translate over to turkeys when you have for the for that resident population are are they targeting uh turkey nests turkey poults adult turkeys uh you know work working in pairs uh and uh you know i guess in contrast to the raccoons that seemed like it was just a little bit more random if you find it you find it you you know um and actually i've got a question in relation to that too if a nest is found is that nest doomed it if the nest is found if it's a critter that eats eggs yes yeah. I mean, that they're, they're going to consume m- many, if not all of the eggs. Um, there are some critters like rat snakes that will consume a few eggs at a time and come back on a different day to consume more of the eggs. But many of these mammals like raccoons or coyotes, you would expect them to, to eat the entire clutch. Mm-hmm. Or at least eat enough of the eggs to where when the hen returns, she's like, wait a minute, what just happened here? I, I you know, I, I'm not sitting here. There's eggs scattered all over the place and, uh, you know, I'm done. I'm, I'll abandon this, this clutch. I imagine, you know, I guess I can't get completely in the mind of a turkey, but she'd probably feel pretty unsafe there too. Like, eh, this is not a good spot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The, the question about coyotes and turkeys is more complex. So, one thing we don't really have a good understanding of. So when a, when a coyote eats a deer, the hair remains in the scat. So when we recover the, 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 the scat, the droppings, you can identify the hair and you can clearly identify a fawn from an adult based on the diameter of the hairs, but bird remains are digested more than hair and bone, for instance. So when, for instance, if a coyote eats a turkey egg 
we're not going to recover that and scat. We're not going to find eggshells and, 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 and yolks and stuff like that. The other thing that happens is when, when coyotes eat feathers, the feathers get crunched up into this almost like you, you can tell that it's the quill of a feather, but it is impossible to know what that feather is. Now, some emerging gen, um, genetics testing is allowing folks to get at this much better. So we don't really have a good grasp for, for like, you know, how many turkeys does a coyote or a group of coyotes kill in a year? But we do know that coyotes kill adults. We know that coyotes eat eggs and we know that coyotes kill broods. We, we know that. Um, and we have known that. And, and I, I actually have some work ongoing now looking at, at coyote interactions with hens and with broods. And it does appear based on the data we've looked at when a coyote interacts with a brood. In other words, when they come across a brood of young poults, it doesn't end well for the poults. Um, that, that, that coyote is very likely going to take some of those poults or the, the hen herself. And obviously that's a, that's, that's problematic. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, on the, you know, in the private sector, what a person could potentially do, um, uh, to, you know, improve habitat or make it optimal. And, and I really liked what you said about, you know, in enhancing essentially what's working on your place, like where's the bright spot and, and focus on that. On the predator management side of things, can individuals, you know, uh, collectively have a positive impact on recruitment via predator management, be it hunting or trapping? If yes, to do that, you need to understand that what, what research has shown first and foremost is that for predator management to be the most successful, it needs to be paired with habitat management. Okay. So if you're, if, if you're thinking about implementing predator management, just understand that your expectations need to be tempered one around, are you doing, you know, are you also trying to enhance your habitat from a turkey's perspective? If you are, then your predator management efforts are likely to be more effective than if not. The other thing you need to understand with, with predator management is research has clearly shown that for it to be the most effective, it needs to be extensive. And what that means is to cover as much area as possible and to be as intensive as it can, meaning take a big hit on the, on whatever population you're trying to affect and understand with turkeys, like we've talked about, there are many things that kill turkeys and eat eggs. So a program focused on trapping and removing a number of mammalian predators is likely to be more impactful than targeting just raccoons or just coyotes or whatever the case may be. So what I usually tell people is if, if you're, in, first of all, if you're interested in trapping, do it because trapping, I, I trapped for years. I loved it. I wish I had time to do it now. I just don't. Trapping teaches you an attention to detail and teaches you to read the natural world in a way that you otherwise don't. Some of, some of the best woodsmen I've ever been around were professional trappers. You are going to see the world differently. When you start trying to figure out how to put an animal inside of a trap or how to put an animal's foot inside of a trap, it teaches you detail. You, you really start to kind of see things a little differently. You start to view where would be a good location for me to catch an animal. Well, that forces you to go look at sign and to figure out what tracks you're looking at and which direction they were walking and wh what were the wind conditions when 
they ended up on that road or on that path. What was the weather like, et cetera, these, these things that's valuable to me. The other thing that I think is great about trapping is in many places, not all, but in many places, trapping seasons often are after some of our hunting seasons. So it gives you more, it gives you something to do with your time. It gives you, it lengthens your hunting season. It, it allows you to get out in the woods at a time of the year that maybe otherwise you were not. And there's always benefit in that. That being said, be realistic. If you, if you're like me and, and you can, you literally can trap on a property near where I'm sitting right now, I may be able to put traps out three or four nights at, you know, a winter and I may catch four or five animals during that effort. And, and really, uh, am I making any impact on the turkey population? No, I'm not. I'm removing four or five raccoons from a, from a property. Um, but if I can just save one turkey, Mike, if I can save one turkey. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the thing with trapping and predator management. It's not a zero sum game. In other words, killing a raccoon is not creating a turkey nest. You know, taking a bobcat is not ensuring that one hen will survive. You, what you need to look at it as it's a it's one tool in the toolbox. And if you can be if you can be extensive and intensive with that tool, it's no different than say management of habitat for as being a tool obviously if you if you were to if you were to seek hey how would i make habitat better on this property well you would certainly be better off to be as broad as you could and intensive as you could it's the same analogy with trapping if you're going to if you if your expectation is i want to see this work and i want to see it matter then understand that you need to you need to be intensive about it and also recognize that and research has clearly shown this, that from a predator standpoint, many of these species backfill very quickly. And what I mean by that is you can go in and take out a large percentage of the population and the next year it's like you never did anything. So you do need to kind of, you know, repeat this, this, annually and keep coming back and doing the same thing over and over and over. And if you do that, then your expectation should be better than say me catching these four or five raccoons a year nearby. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, like extreme weather events, like a hurricane, right? I've always been curious and maybe this is regional as well, but like, what does an optimal spring look like for the wild turkey? And, and I guess by, you know, noting that that could be different, it's like, well, you know, the Gould's turkey in Mexico is having a different spring than our eastern turkeys in Wisconsin. But w so what's optimal for, you know, just the success of nests via weather? Like, is can too much rain be a bad thing? Or does, does a lot of rain mean that there's going to be a, a great green up and lots of insects? What's, what's going on there? Yeah, in a general sense, understanding what you just said, that, that, you know, there's some variability across the species range. But in a general sense, having a wet or or a reasonably wet winter um, coupled with favorable winter conditions, you know, not super, super cold, deep, deep snow, uh not a mass failure year where there's no acorns on the ground, but a reasonable winter conditions coupled with plenty of precipitation. What that does is it allows hens to come through the winter in good shape to be as fat as she can and fat in the bird world's good. And then for spring green up to progress and then have a reasonably dry spring and and what that allows is when and, and here's an aside so when a turkey is incubating when she's sitting on the nest weather is not really that problematic to her okay. because she's she's sitting there and 
the eggs are protected. They're under her. So, you know, a few days of cold or a few days of this, not a big deal. She, she just hunkers down and deals with it. What's more problematic is when you get hens that start hatching and then we get these three days of 50 degree weather and, and rain, or we get, you know, these, these cold snaps or these drenching downpours, um, or when we get severe drought. So you can almost have, you know, you can have two ends of the pendulum there. You get through a reasonably dry spring birds are starting to hatch they're in good condition because winter was good and then suddenly you get a a a really dry six or eight weeks and what happens then is that insect communities decline dramatically and poults have more difficult time foraging and capturing insects and you can kind of see what happens from there the flip side of that is she starts hatching and we start getting these monsoon rains, cool temperatures, and we know clearly that kills poults because they can't regulate their body temperature. So to be honest with you, what we're looking for in the turkey world is just quote unquote normal. <laughs> right. If we can if you can just be relatively normal then you can have some good years. And to be honest with you, there are some states here in the southeast that have some pockets that the last few years it appears production has been pretty good and when you look at the conditions they were fairly normal there was a a fairly normal winter there was a pretty dry spring not a lot of inclement weather during the brooding period not a lot of heavy rain and lo and behold what you see you you see that production was a it was a there was an uptick you know and and that's really in some cases it's not all it's going to take but but normality is good in the turkey production world yeah that makes sense you know nothing nothing too extreme either way kind of right in the middle which can be maybe easier said than done i tell you what the more we talk about the things that affect these birds um it's just always it's astonishing to me that any of them make it. <laughs> and, I know, and that and that even in some areas that we have them, in the numbers that we do. Um, God, I was I was listening to you talk on a, a different podcast, Mike. But like, like, what are the odds that like a turkey makes it to adulthood? I mean, you were talking about you know areas of like eighty percent, you know, just of the nests like not successful. Like, how special is an adult wild turkey? Yeah, so there. I'm actually going to post some of this information that there have been some others that kind of laid the founder found work the foundation for me to do the work I do now. People like Wayne Bailey and Lovett Williams and and some of these folks that that wrote about this. Lovett actually wrote years ago about you know this is what it takes to produce one gobbler, you know, one tom. But if you just look at So just consider these numbers. So if 80% of your nests fail, so you have 20% of your nests produce eggs. And if two thirds of those fail within the first month, that means that about 7% of your nest produce one or more poults. And then you have continued mortality during the summer of these poults that are say a month old or older. And then you get to fall and let's say you're, you know, let's say you're a hen, for instance, you, you then get through the winter. You are literally special because you're a a juvenile hen that made it. You actually made it into the fall flock. Then you try, you go through the following year and understand that, that annual survival for hens is about 70%. So 30% of them are going to be killed by predators. And if you do that through a number of years, the probability that you're going to live to be more than about four or five years old is zero. (laughs) 
Okay. Well then, then take your Tom. So you've got these, these young male poults that, that they made it. There weren't, there aren't many of them, right? There were 7% of the nest produced a, what could be a, a male poult. Well, then you, you, you're a Jake. Um, you're not really contributing much to the population at that point. Some of you are going to be lost to predation um, in your first year, and then you make it to be a two-year-old. And what we see is about half of the harvest is two-year-olds. So if not more. So the probability that you, first of all, ever look down the gun barrel at an adult Tom is already in many ways beyond special. Yeah. But the probability that you look down the barrel at a three or four year old bird is truly a remarkable feat. It, because if you ever made it to adulthood, half of you are going to die that year, that first year that you breed. And then every year thereafter, you're there are those older birds are being taken out of the population. So for you to, you know, to look down the gun barrel at an at an adult wild turkey is something special. It really is. It really is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Uh I and just hearing you talk through that, like it's always special when you take any wild turkey. But you think about doing something like that and it is incredible and and you really do appreciate how darn special uh these birds are and and i mean you know what what they represent uh in their entirety is just uh truly something to behold and something to be uh, appreciate protect uh and uh and uh enhance and and do what we can to uh you know foster and and, and bolster their populations for sure yeah i think when i think wild turkeys i think conserve and sustain that's the i mean we have to do what we can collectively to sustain the birds in the populations we have now and try to improve those populations and we need to conserve the landscapes that that this bird flourishes in because there's so many competing interests in our world right now i mean that we're not making more land but we're making more people Mm -hmm. and it's putting increasing challenges on us as a society. We have to produce food. We have to house ourselves. We have to have space. We have to do all these things to to make the world work. But we also have this bird and many other species that use these same areas of the landscape that we cherish. And if we lose the ability to pursue th- this bird or the other game species that that make us who we are as hunters, then we've lost a part of ourselves. And in some cases, you know, the biggest part of ourselves, you know, if you told me, well, your turkey season's over with, bud, I wouldn't, hell, I wouldn't, I mean, just, you know, put me out to pasture, man. (laughs) I mean, if I couldn't, if spring was, well, I let's go fishing and no offense to that fisherman. I love to fish too, but it's like, "Mm, no, no, thanks, man. Give me those spring woods. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Mike, and and uh, yeah, definitely could not have said that better myself. Um, I know I couldn't have, in fact, but I mean, you're you're 100 percent right, man. They're they're a special bird, and they represent so much, and are incredibly important, and and we are lucky to have them. And uh, you know, it sounds like uh, there's uh, a little bit of work to be done. Um, I was going to close this out, but I do have one more question, Mike. What? Uh, are there any cool projects that you're working on right now that you're excited about? Yeah, a bunch. <laughs> no, did we just um, did we just yeah. start another podcast? No, 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 no. We've got. I, when I say we, I, I do research, but I do research collaboratively with a bunch of people. There, there's. I have graduate students that work with me. I, I can't stand when people say when academics have. I have students that work for me. Um, that drives me nuts. I, so I, I have. I have students that work with me. I have staff members. I have other colleagues at other institutions that collaborate with, with me. 
and it it takes an army if you will and and we have projects all over north america right now that where we're doing everything from monitoring you know nesting and reproductive activities to looking at disease issues and genetics and um monitoring gobbling activity and doing things to try to figure out abundance how many birds are out there these emerging technologies are are just mind-blowing uh artificial intelligence for instance and these tools that allow us to collect data and process it so quickly it's just it's just mind-boggling um all of the work i'm doing now i, I think is cool and I honestly, I, what I think is really the coolest is that there are young people who are passionate about the bird the way I was when I was in their position. And they want to make a difference and they want to do rigorous science and they want to help agencies understand how to mitigate these declines. That's the best part of the of the research is watching these really gifted young people do what they do. Awesome. No, that's awesome. That, uh, you know, I was going to say, you know, are there, are there some bright spots? And I tell you what, I think you answered my question there. That, that is uh that is an amazing bright spot, you know, having, uh, like you said, young people who are passionate about the bird as much as you are and wanting to do the work. Um, yeah, that's just, that's just super neat. We might have to, uh, might have to have you on again to talk about some of these uh, new studies and some of the some of the results and what you got your findings. Yeah, I'd be glad to. We got some really cool stuff coming out right right now. We, I've got, I've got one student who's really really interested. He came to me from from the world of personalities. He's um, there's a lot of researchers that study personalities in in wildlife. Um. And what we're finding pretty clearly is 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 toms have their they have personalities, and there are there's increasing evidence that we are harvesting toms with a certain personality suite. They have a certain type of personality, a certain way of moving, a certain way of using the landscape, and those are the birds we're taking. And, and it doesn't seem to matter what site you're on or what part of the landscape you're on. Those are the birds we're taking. And it really begs the question of, you know, through time, are we going to end up selecting for certain types of toms and selecting against others in a way where some of these birds get increasingly more difficult to hunt? because of their personality and and the way that they go about navigating risk and and us uh there's other work suggesting with other critters that that is the case that some of these traits can can be inherited and if they are it really begs the question of you know what's turkey hunting going to look like down the road if if we if we are kind of selecting for certain types of of toms it some of the stuff is just fascinating to me as a hunter because i think back of all the experiences i've had with different birds and and then i look at some of these things that these students are are seeing in these data sets and it's it really causes me pause super interesting to me that is super interesting you touched on a question i've got my list of questions here uh and one of them that i didn't ask was uh, have <clears throat> have the genetics for the for the turkey to have a propensity to gobble been weeded out over time uh and i mean it sounds like that potentially could there's a there is potential for that yes that we're basically selecting for birds that are less vocal in other words we're when i say selecting for we're 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 taking birds that are more vocal right and in so doing we are selecting four birds that don't gobble as much and 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 i there's a lot of anecdotal information out there if you i talk to hundreds and hundreds of hunters a year and i can't tell you how many have told me that that they've seen it with their own eyes that 
the birds in their population are simply not gobbling like they did 30 years ago. Um, and our gobbling data on our heavily hunted sites shows this, that almost all gobbling is in the tree. And when, when they fly down, they shut up. Yeah. I mean, I feel, I see it with my own eyes. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've seen that over time too. Um, and I, and I didn't know, and, and maybe, golly, we could talk on this turkeys, we could talk turkey forever, Mike, but like, you know, when I got to Wisconsin, I was like, man, these, these Eastern birds are tough. You know, they don't gobble. Yeah. Um, do different species gobble more or less? Uh, like, do, does a, does a Merriam's have more propensity to, to gobble more than an Eastern, or is that a length of time thing as well, where that could potentially be selected out over time? It looks like across the subspecies that it's it's pretty closely linked to hunting pressure. Interesting. In, in the absence of a lot of pressure, it really doesn't matter what subspecies you are. You're going to gobble. Okay. It's it, it, unless you know conditions dictate. You know, weather's super bad, super windy, super rainy, whatever. But but what we've clearly seen and other studies have shown with other subspecies is once the pressure gets on gobbling slows down and in some cases can almost cease if the pressure is is high enough and what's happening there is is we're killing vocal toms but then the toms other toms that that we're not killing are adopting a strategy of calling less and they're doing that obviously to reduce risk right um and I, I see it with my own eyes, you know, gobble, gobble, gobble three times in a tree, hit the ground, never say another word. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a bird that has experienced risk and he's altered his behavior to work around it. I believe it. I've encountered that bird many a time, Mike. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, man. Well, I appreciate your time today. I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate uh, your passion for these birds, all the, all the work you've done over, over your career, the work that you continue to do. Uh, and, uh, man, I'm, I'm just as pumped, uh, to chat with you today as, as I am hopefully down the road here to talk about some of that work. And like we said, your findings and, and hopefully we can uh, learn more about these birds and have more of them. Yeah, I'd be happy to join you. You know, I was happy to join you today. I'm happy to join you again in the future. Appreciate it, Mike. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, Hopefully, you learned a ton about these birds that we all love so much, uh, as I did today. And, uh, man, until next time, happy hunting, shooting. We'll catch you on the next one. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.